Good afternoon and a happy Sabbath to everyone. We are now in the season of the Passover. Many of you might know this season as the season of Lent or the Holy Week. But the Bible calls it the Passover or the Festival of the Unleavened Bread. And we can go this to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14, talking about this season. And we read, on the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Sure. Hindi ko sure. The Passover season is a good time to be reminded of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that took away our sins, the sins of humanity. So may we at this particular time, before we proceed further with the Bible study on rise to glory, let us all bow our heads for a short blessing of the assembly. Holy Father, great God in heaven, we come before your majestic throne of grace, Father, this afternoon. Uh, Father, please be with us uh, in this Bible study session of Rise to Glory, Father, that we may understand what kind of love that you have extended to you, to your people, Father, that you have not withhold your son, Jesus Christ, but you have sent him into the world, Father. Um, to redeem our sins, that we may have life and have it more abundant. Father, we thank you for the protection that you have given us uh, in the past week. And uh, we know that there is a pandemic that is raging across the world. Father, kindly protect your people, who wherever we are, uh, that your spirit may shield us from uh, the troubles that is in this world. Father, uh, let your spirit guide us into your truths, into your understanding, Father. Father, we give this um, service of the Bible study into your hands that you may inspire all of us, uh, especially the hearing, Father, that we may learn from you, Father. Father, all these things we pray, uh, knowing that you are with us and that your spirit of your son, Jesus Christ, may be with us, Father, as well. All this, we give you thanks and glory now and forever. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. This afternoon, we will talk about the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is a reminder of how God loves us and how he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem our sins that we may have life and have it more abundant, as we have mentioned earlier. Therefore, the title of this message, this Bible study topic this afternoon is Rise to Glory. Jesus walked through the darkness and the evil of this world to redeem mankind. That includes you and myself and to bring all of us to glory. All the evil that could befall a man we fail on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this message, we will explore the malevolence and the cruelty and evil that Jesus had to walk through in order to save humanity. Then we can truly appreciate the faith, love, and kindness of God against the backdrop of the suffering and passion of Jesus. And in the process, learn precious lessons from it, and that we may walk by them. The life Jesus lived was one filled with sorrow, grief, and pain. It was an easy life. It was a life of sorrow. The only joy Jesus had was doing the work of the eternal Father. And to, and to accomplish the work 
he had to walk through darkness, the valley of death. We have never comprehended Isaiah chapter 53 completely. But this afternoon, we will try to do so. Before we go there, let us consider the life of Jesus. Jesus was familiar with sorrow, as we have learned from the scripture. And most probably, Jesus lost his father at an early age. The scripture no longer mentions Joseph after Jesus was 12 years old. Jesus would have had to support the family. He was estranged from his siblings early on and disliked by his own townmates. He was criticized at every turn. He had low esteem from the people. He was hated by the people that he came to save. He was criticized at every turn, at risks from the authorities and in danger of the sinners. Eventually, he was betrayed by a close friend, arrested and charged as a criminal, and those close to him abandoned him. He was arrested, he was flogged, scorched, crucified, mocked and ridiculed. And he saw his mother grieve for his sufferings and death. Jesus was tempted with all the evil that could befall a man. He experienced all the evil. He walked through the darkest valley with a purpose. He walked through it into glory, his and ours. He walked through darkness and conquered evil for our sake. He experienced a lot of cruelty in the process. Human nature at its worst can be extremely cruel. Jesus experienced the worst of human cruelty. Yet his love and compassion for humanity never diminished. The scripture says Jesus came to his own and his own rejected him. This must, must be extremely disheartening. He came to his very own chosen people. Yet the Hebrews, the elders of Israel, Rejected him. Rejected him. Jesus received the most inhumane treatment from the people he came to save. Jesus came preaching salvation in the kingdom of God. He taught with authority. He revealed the truth. He imparted divine wisdom. He taught in the synagogue, preached in the fields, rubbed shoulders with the rich, and died with the poor. He forgave sins, comforted the weak, gave peace to the weary, gave hope to the lost, revealed himself to creation, and revealed the eternal Father. Yet, he was considered a blasphemer, a sinner, a glutton, and a drunkard. Our Lord also performed great miracles, and these miracles could only come from God. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, restored the hearing of the deaf, made the lame walk, drove out demons, raised the dead. Yet, these good deeds were dismissed and even attributed to Baal Zebub. The chief priests and the elders hated Jesus Christ. They plotted to kill him. They bribed Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. They had Jesus arrested on a false charge of rebellion and sedition, gave Jesus a mock trial and charged him with blasphemy. They sent him to Pilate and demanded Pilate to sentence Jesus to death, threatened Pontius Pilate that he is no friend of Caesar 
if he let Jesus go free, persuaded the crowd to ask for the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus, persuaded the crowd to have Jesus executed and demanded that Jesus be crucified. They all chanted, crucify him, crucify him. It must have been a humbling, sad, and disheartening experience for Christ to be treated with such hatred and evil despite all the goodness he had shown the people. And he was tortured. The Roman soldiers, by craft and vocation, were the most cruel trained killers and torturers of their time. They were feared for their ruthlessness. The Roman soldiers, they were godless, mean, and merciless. Jesus suffered the most physical injury and trauma from the cruel Roman soldiers. They mocked him, put a scarlet rod on him, put a staff on his right hand, and insulted him. Twisted a crown of thorn and set it on his head. They physically tortured Jesus. They flogged him, scorched him, repeatedly struck him on the head, slapped him, and stripped him. And he, they torn his flesh with weakness. They made him carry his own cross, nailed him to the stake, and pierced his side with a spear. None of the two criminals crucified alongside Jesus were treated in a similar manner. Jesus suffered the worst of the Roman soldiers' cruelty. Jesus was not spared any mercy. The chief priests passed by Golgotha witnessing the execution. And they mock and ridiculed Jesus, saying, He saves others, but cannot save himself. At the Passover season, this particular season, <clears throat> when Jesus became our Passover lamb, the Passover lamb of God, we are reminded of his suffering. The suffering that he went through just for you and I and me so that we can have life and have it more abundant. Jesus said that no greater love is there than to die for a friend. And we are his friend. And he died for all of us. Jesus, the love of God, went through a great sacrifice. He experienced the worst of human cruelty. In the midst of cruelty, Jesus extends mercy unto all. Indeed, he was a lamb of God. Isaiah spoke and wrote about it 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Indeed, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The understanding of this very scripture is a revelation coming only from the Holy Spirit. And this afternoon, we will try to go there and understand what Isaiah 53 says. But before we go there, let us consider an account in the book of Acts, and this time in the 8th chapter, when God sent Philip to explain this particular prophecy to the Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopian eunuch, he was a believer, a, a convert, to Judaism, and he went to Jerusalem to the temple to worship God. And upon his return, 
God sent Philip to meet up with the Ethiopian union. And we start uh, in verse 26 as we go into the verses. So now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the uh, Kandik, which means the queen of Ethiopia. So he was a very important person, a rank, high-ranking official of the queen of Ethiopia. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in a chariot and he was reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. So the spirit told Philip, he said, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran out to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. Then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? The Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah chapter 53. For him, it was perplexing. Okay, he was reading sort of a suffering servant. And he asked Philip, Philip, is the prophet talking about himself or he was talking about someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture in Isaiah 53 and told him the good news about Jesus. So what did Philip tell the Ethiopian eunuch? It says here that from the very passage of scripture, Philip told the eunuch the good news about Jesus. We are going through the life of Jesus. You know, the difficulties, the challenges, the sorrows, the torture that he went through. Right? And those are the things that Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch. So Philip took the opportunity, went into the passage of scripture, and revealed Jesus Christ to him. Now, just like the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian eunuch, armed with the proper comprehension of the circumstances of Jesus' life and his sufferings, we now can read Isaiah 53. We have mentioned the life of Jesus, you know, that he was acquainted with sorrow, with grief, how he, was, how he suffered and how he was tortured. You know, with all those as our background, okay, we now go and read Isaiah chapter 53. Okay. So as they travel along the road, they came to the water, some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Eunuch asked Philip. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. You want to be baptized? Sure. But you must believe with your whole being. 
The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That He came as a suffering servant. He suffered. He died for our sins. That's, that's basically what the eunuch said. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Isaiah 53. This is a prophecy about the suffering Messiah. About the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was a life that is acquainted with sorrow, with grief, with pain, with suffering. And we know this as we have gone through these things earlier. So when we read this one, Isaiah 5, chapter 53, we can now recall all the things that he went through. For you and the entire humanity. Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 1. He says, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's a remarkable and an almost incomprehensible thing. You know, that God sent his son to die for all of us. You know, who can believe that message? It's an incredible message that he came, he suffered, and he died for us. And this is the beginning statement of Isaiah. Okay. This is profound that God sent his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. But he sent his son to suffer and to redeem all of us. Hey, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay. And this is only revealed to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In verse 2, he said, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. You know, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. Jesus Christ was a very ordinary, common-looking man. He may be a bit rough and rugged, being a carpenter by profession, he was not impressive. He was not good looking. He was not even charismatic. There is nothing in him that we should be starting. Very ordinary person. He said, he was despised and rejected by mankind. We learned that he came to his own and his own rejected him. He was estranged from his siblings. People don't like him. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Pain is both mental, physical, emotional, and also physical. Like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in law esteem. People avoided him. When they see him coming their way, they would step aside. And we, people, look at him and held him in low esteem. He wasn't respected very much. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Yeah, he suffered. And he was pierced for what? 
not for himself, because he did something wrong. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. He is our Savior. He took our sins upon himself. And he died for us. Verse 6, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. We have read this earlier. We know how he was cruelly treated. And the torture that he went to, through, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And indeed he was. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was given a mock trial, forced charges. Yet, who of his generation protested? No, they cried for blood. Crucify him, they shouted. For he was cut off from the land of the living. Yes, he was crucified for us. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. When he has suffered all of this in our behalf to take away our sins, God said, there is glory that will come out, come out of this. He said, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. After Jesus Christ has died for us, you know, he will rise to glory. And he will see the people he came to save. To rise to glory as well. And he will be happy. He will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. And he will bear the iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death. And was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many. And made intercession for the transgression. Everything Isaiah wrote about the suffering Messiah was true. Jesus experienced, suffered all the evil that is in this world. The Ethiopian eunuch understood. And believe that this was referring to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was baptized with full faith. And he was saved. From noon until three o'clock in the afternoon came darkness over the land. When Jesus Christ was crucified, <clears throat> Okay. At midday, 12 noon, until 3 o'clock, darkness came upon the land. There was total darkness. And about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthan, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? At this particular time, okay, 
the sins of the world. Your sin, my sin, sin of everyone was put on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ bore the sins of the world. And for that brief moment, the sin that he carried separated him from God, the Father. And he fell for the first time alone. The internal Father was not with him. All through his earthly ministry, okay, the Father was with him all the way. He prayed, he talked to the Father all the time. Okay. The eternal Father was with him, comforting him. During the time when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying to God in tears and sweat. Okay. And he prayed three times to God, the Father. God was with him. And God sent angels to strengthen him and to comfort him. God was with him throughout the ordeal. Everything that Jesus felt, the eternal Father felt. They were together in this magnificent plan of salvation. But at that moment when all the sins was put on Jesus' head, that moment, Jesus felt alone because the sin has separated mankind from God. And for that brief moment, Jesus was alone. And he cried to God, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he carried the weight of the sin of humanity unto himself. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Imagine at three o'clock in the afternoon, from 12 o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon, it was total darkness. And Jesus spoke his last saying, unto your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. And during these three hours, total darkness covered the land, okay, from high noon to three in the afternoon, when the sun was supposed to shine the brightest, it was pitch dark. At that moment, the temple ground was stilled, okay, there were lots of people in the temple preparing for the Passover, but when darkness came, the temple ground was stilled by the darkness and commotion, chaos filled the temple ground. The temple activities halted. But at Jesus' death, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the moment that he breathed his last, the light broke through the darkness. Darkness vanished from the sky and the brilliant midday sun came up and the light shone through the darkness. Light streamed into the temple courts and into the holy place. And in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 51, we read that at that moment, when the light broke through the darkness, and the light streamed into the holy place. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook. And the rocks split. The veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, where the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant is situated, representing the eternal God, the veil signifies the separation of God and mankind because of sin. And we have read this in Isaiah 59 in verse 2. God said, your iniquity have separated between you and your God. There was a separation. There was a veil that separates us from God. But at the moment of Jesus' death, that 
veil was red, torn into from top to bottom. The veil was torn when Jesus Christ died on the cross, signifying that the separation has been lifted. And now we have direct access to God as a direct result of Christ's sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is not our Passover Lamb. Jesus is the Passover Lamb of God that he sacrificed for us. But Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay. And this is what Hebrews talks about Jesus. Let me digress a little bit to the book of Hebrews. He said, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the holy place, or most holy place, had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. The first tabernacle, you have the veil that covers the most holy place and the holy place. And that was the one that was rent. He said, but when Jesus came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. He went through himself to God the Father. You know, there is no more veil between us and God. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and cows, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus attaining eternal redemption. Talking about Jesus, that we have direct access to the eternal Father through our Savior, Jesus Christ. At the moment of Jesus' death, the sin that separates man from God was taken away. Now we have direct access to God through the sacrifice of Christ for the forgiveness of sin and for our eternal reconciliation with our eternal. So God coming back to Matthew chapter 27, when all this happened, when darkness vanished and the light streamed into the holy place and the Veil ran into, and the earth shook. The centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, and all that had happened, they were terrified. And they came to the conclusion as they exclaimed, Surely he was the son. From all of this cruelty came mercy. Jesus said, the first thing that Jesus said when he was crucified was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are. First word, the moment that he was crucified on the cross, bloodied, as he is, suffering as he was. He said, because that was his mission. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are. In the midst of cruelty, he offers mercy. In the face of death, he offers life. He came not to condemn the world. Rather, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he came to save the world. This was the extent of his grace, compassion, and love for humanity. We are all included here. God 
in his mercy, forgave the crowd who were crying for blood. You remember the throng of people who went to the palace of Pontius Pilate, crying, crucify him, crucify him. God forgave them. 3,000 of them were baptized on the day of Pentecost. And 5,000 a few days later. God shows mercy to all who are willing to repent. God did not hold grudges on them. Said, hey, you crucified me. You know, you're going to pay for it. No. He came to save them. And he did. Forgave them, saved them, and gave them the Holy Spirit that day of the Pentecost and thereafter. How about the priests? Even the priests who waited the evidence before them and saw the majesty and evidence of the resurrected Christ, many became obedient to the faith. The priests who were in the temple, who saw the darkness, they were afraid, and the light broke in, and the temple veil rent in two. A lot of them would have thought hard because they saw the evidence. In Acts chapter 6, in verse 7, we read, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests. So who are these people again? Priests. Became obedient. To the faith. The priests. Who were in the temple. At the time of Jesus' death. And saw those things. They were pricked to their heart. God. Forgave them. When they repented. And believed, they were added to the number of the disciples. Paul. Paul's conversion came much later. He was not part of the 12 and not even part of the initial converts. Paul was still fuming murderous intentions when confronted by Jesus while on his way to Damascus. Paul realized he was the greatest sinner. And he said so. Yet, God had mercy unto him. In the midst of unspeakable cruelty, he persecuted the church, brought many to persecutions. Christ offered grace and mercy. His mercy is open to the high priest. You will wonder what happens now to the high priest, Caiaphas, and Annas. How about the members of the Sanhedrin, Pontius Pilate, and the soldiers? What's their fate? Well, the answer is God's mercy is open to all of them and all who will believe in his name. Because in Romans chapter 5, this is what Paul wrote, talking about his personal experience. He said, for if we were enemies, Paul was an enemy. Was he different from the members of the Sanhedrin? Or was he different from the high priests? He wasn't any different. He persecuted the church. Right? For if we were enemies, we will reconcile. Wow. To God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled. We shall be saved. By his life. Paul talking about his personal experience. And that is what the mercy of God is all about. He didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners like Paul. Like us. 
So after the suffering, he entered into glory. So from the darkest valley, the valley of death, Jesus walked into glory. Jesus was taken to the heavens as the disciples look on. And we can read a few scriptures on this. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, he said, So we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Yes, he was made like one of us. Now, crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He took our place. And again, in Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 3, he said, The sun is the radiance of God's glory. So Jesus Christ, after his suffering, you know, he said, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down with his full radiance of the glory of God. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty. He took his place with the eternal father. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty, the eternal father in, in his full glory. And again, in Acts chapter 7, verse 5, 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of Stephen, while being stoned, he was given this rare opportunity to peer into the heavens and look into the very throne room of God. And he saw God, the eternal Father, and Jesus Christ by his right hand. And he said, look, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man, meaning Jesus Christ, standing at the right hand of God in his glory. So Jesus Christ, after his suffering, he entered glory. And the purpose of that is to bring the children of God into glory as well. And that is the entire purpose. And this is what we read in Hebrews chapter 2. He said, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. So there is a glory that awaits the children of God. So it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he said. Jesus Christ suffered everything. All the evils of this world, he suffered all of it. Okay, Because he is our perfect mediator. He understands us thoroughly. He has to be made like one of us and he has to go through like one of us. In fact, he suffered more than anyone in the entire history of mankind ever suffered. No one ever suffered as much as he did. He suffered everything that a man could ever suffer. All the evils of this world, he walked through. So he was perfect. I think past tense, perfected through what he suffered. And through his suffering, he can be our mediator. So both the one who makes man holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Jesus came with a mission. You know, it was difficult to go through the kind of suffering that he did. Not only physical, not only the torture, not only the death. 
but the mental, psychological, emotional suffering that he went through. That he was disliked by most of the people. That must be disheartening, right? He came to his own, not only his own creation, but his own people, and he was rejected. It hurts. Source of great sorrow. He went through this mission. He saw it. He knew what will happen to him, you know. But he went through it. Jesus came. To save a brother and a sister from death. He walked through darkness into glory to accomplish this mission. So how did he do it? How did Jesus Christ do it? No. You will tell me because he was God. No, no. He was a man when he came. He divested of his divinity. He came as one like us, flesh and blood. He did it. Why? Ice on the goal. He came with a mission. Jesus was able to walk through the darkness and face all the evil because he had his eye on the goal. Brethren, we too have our lives to live. We see Jesus. How he suffered for a purpose. He lived his life accompanying, accompanying the work that the eternal father gave. He has a purpose. He has a vision. He has a purpose. He has an end goal. His eyes is always on the goal. In our case, in our case, brethren, we have our lives to live. Life's journey can be challenging. We know that. Filled with trials and sufferings. Some of us may be wrestling with difficulties, hardship, pain, of, or some form of distress. Some of us may be walking in the dark valley right now. Perhaps going through a few things. Some of us may have, may be having health conditions, maybe suffering from an injury, suffering from a fall, an illness, a sickness, a pain here and a pain there, undergoing certain therapy, or a concerning report from a doctor, or suffering from a health condition. We're not at the pink of our health. Or you might be suffering through a family crisis. There is quarrel within the family, quarrel between siblings. There's family squabble, strained relationship, problems with in-laws, problems with relatives. You might be having a family crisis or a broken relationship, a difficult marriage, a breakup, with your best friend, okay, or boyfriend or girlfriend, or facing a divorce or annulment, or a broken marriage. And some of us might be, might be having a career difficulty. With this pandemic, might have lost some income, some might lose your job. You have a difficult boss, toxic working environment, difficult colleagues. You know? Or you have a career problem. The company is not doing well. Your job is at stake. And some of us must be having some financial problems. We have some financial need, obligations to meet, debt to pay, needs to be fulfilled. 
or some of us must be struggling with temptation and struggling with addiction, obsession, bad habits, and the like. We might be walking, we may be walking in a dark place, in a dark valley right now. Our problems are temporary. It will all pass away in your life. The pain, the discomfort, the suffering we experience today cannot be compared to the glory that awaits us. We need to walk through life's challenges with confidence knowing that better things are ahead of us. We have to walk with confidence. We know that there will be problems. There will be challenges. There will be trials. There will be sufferings. Yes, some of them are for our strengthening. Okay. Some of them are difficult to handle. But God has gone before us. Or Christ has gone before us. We've seen it, he has experienced it, he has paved the way for us. And he said he will not leave us nor forsake us. In this struggle of life, he comforts us. He walks alongside us. Therefore, we are assured that better things, better days, and better rewards awaits us, the saints. And here are some encouraging words spoken of by Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth. And he said, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Okay. God doesn't want us to have too much difficult challenges. You know, that will despair our life. No, no, that's not God, our Father. We know that in this broken world, you know, these things will happen. In a perfect world, everything will be fine. But in a broken world, like the world that we live in today, when sin controls the earth, the world, there will be difficulties and sufferings, okay? But our God is a God of compassion and he is a God of all comfort. And he will be with us and he will comfort us. Verse four, who comforts us in all our troubles. Yes, God is there. God is always there. No matter what you are going through today, no matter what kind of a valley of darkness that you are in, whether it be a health issue, financial issue, okay, relationship issue, okay, addiction issue, whatever is your problem, God is there to comfort us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We know that God's comfort us. We are comforted. And we see people in trouble. We can comfort them as well. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, what we suffered, Christ suffered as well. Far more, I would say. So also our comfort abounds to Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Apostle said, uh, the Apostle Paul said, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering that we suffer. And our hope is for you, and our hope for you is firm because we know just that just as you share in our sufferings, so also we share in our hope. 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despair of life itself. The Apostle Paul went through much suffering. Okay. And he, he knows what we are going through as well. So indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. I on the goal. Okay. I on the goal. The end goal, which is to rise with Christ in glory. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to be deliver us. Okay. Then let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Basically, he's talking about the same thing. He said, therefore, since we have this ministry, just as God has shown us mercy, we do not become discouraged. Okay. God has shown us mercy. So why should we be discouraged? He said, do not become discouraged. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. It is the one who shines in our hearts to give us the light of the glorious knowledge of God in the face of Christ. He said, but we are, but we have this treasure in clay of jars so that the, extra, oh, the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. So all of the things that we experience, okay, is for us to grow and draw closer to God. We are experiencing trouble on every side, but are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our life. For we are, for we who are alive are constantly being handed over to death for Christ's sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal. As a result, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. As a res but since we have the same spirit of faith, as that shown in what has been written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. And in verse 14, he said, we do so because we know that the one who raised up Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Always eyes on the goal, looking at the glory that will be given to God's people. For all these things are for your sake, so that the grace that is including more and more people may become thanks, may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory. Of God. Therefore, do not despair. When we're experiencing difficulty, trials, challenges, when we're faced with them, do not be discouraged. But even if our physical body is wearing away, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Can you imagine what Paul is saying? Paul also had lived a difficult life. He was persecuted all the way okay, until his death. But he said, all of these are momentary. Light suffering compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits. And because we are not looking at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. Eyes on the goal. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen, he said, is eternal. 
Therefore, with life's challenges, let us walk as Jesus walked. We may have to walk through life's difficulties, challenges, before entering the same glory just as Jesus did. We need to continually fix our eyes on the goal. There is a glory that awaits all of us. At the end of this human experience, a glory awaits the righteous. That's it. And this is what Paul, I would I believe that Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews. And we said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of Jesus, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Okay? The pioneer and perfecter of our faith that he has run before us, that he has paved the way, that he had made perfect for us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Take a cue from Jesus. Take him as an example. Learn from him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That is the encouragement. And here is what he says regarding the glory that awaits the saints. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We share in the suffering of Jesus. We shall share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. With eternal joy. And this is what Peter said. He said, and when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the crown of glory that will never fail. Crown of glory. Always eyes on the ground. If you see a difficulty coming your way, walk by faith, walk through it. Okay? Know that God is with you. He is beside you. He comforts you. He walks with you. Okay? He holds your hand and safely You will walk through it. And at the end of it, you will receive the crown of glory. So in summation, I want to go to Psalm 23. I think it's a very beautiful and fitting psalm to close uh, our Bible study this afternoon. King David was experiencing a time of doom and gloom. Okay. His life wasn't a bed of roses as well. He had his difficult times. People wanted his life too. Under such jurists in danger, he wrote Psalm 23. David felt danger as though death was near. Sometimes when we go through difficulties and challenges, we think that there is no solution. That, you know, this is it. This is the end. Hardship, perils, chaos, and deep suffering were invading his life. Hey, sometimes we also experience that. 
you know, all of these troubles are flooding in, you know, and we're experiencing them. In a foreign world, these things will invade our lives too. David felt that. All the troubles came into his life. And in our fallen world, these things will invade our lives too. At some point, we will make that long, slow, painful walk through the dark path. Hopefully, we will emerge glorious and victorious at the end. And this is a beautiful psalm written by King David when he was really feeling out and down and he was in danger. And when people were chasing him and his life was in danger. And he wrote in verse 1, Psalm 23, he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack not. What a comforting verse. You know, I said, you know, God, if you are my shepherd, if you are with me, if you watch over me and you take care of me, I don't lack anything. I'm sufficient. I'm happy. He's talking from the perspective of himself being a shepherd. When the sheep, sheep are uh, under his care, the sheep are in good spirit, good condition, because the shepherd is there to take care of them. No harm will come upon them and none be lost. David said, God, you are my shepherd. I lack nothing. I feel comfortable. I'm relaxed. I'm sustained. Statement of great faith. And hopefully we can say that also to God. God, you are my shepherd. What else do I need? I lack. In verse 2, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. What security God affords. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, uh, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes, if you are by my side, God, no matter where I go through, no matter where I walk, where no matter where the path would take me, even to the darkest valley, I feel nothing. I will fear no evil. You know what, God? Because you are with me. You are beside me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Because they protect me. Right? You are my shepherd. You are my protector. Okay. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Who shall I fear? My enemies? No. In fact, I'll continue to be in your presence because you have prepared a table of feasting for me. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. What else shall we ask? If God is with us, there's nothing more that we can ask. It's more than sufficient. It overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. God, being my shepherd, I put my life into your hands. 
And you can only provide me all the goodness and the love that you can offer. Not only today, but all my existence, all the days of my life. And finally, King David said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. It's a beautiful sound. I wonder. Let's all walk with faith, confidence through life's unpleasant challenges and difficulties. Face them as they come. Stand firm, stay the course, fix our eyes on Jesus, our forerunner and the perfecter of our faith. And this is what Psalms 23 is all about. Fear none, have God beside us. He is there to protect us. Yeah, though we may have a little bit of challenges, difficulties, you know, we'll walk through them. Because Christ walked through them. And we will emerge victorious and glorious. Brethren and friends, Jesus said that in this life, we will have trouble. You may be carrying a problem, a hurt, a need, a trial, or experiencing sorrow, grief, threat, or maybe in danger, or suffering from injustice, injury, health, maybe pain. Always remember what Jesus said. Jesus said that I have told you these things so that you may, so that in me you may have peace. So God said, yeah, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. So. But take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have troubles, you're going to have problems, you're going to have headaches, you know, you're going to have all of those stuff, right? But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ has paved the way. He understands all the troubles that we're going through. He is here to help. He is our shepherd. We lack not. So at the end of this presentation, we ask the question, what can I leave with you today? What lesson can we learn from the experience of what Jesus went through? Yeah. I've said a lot of, of things. So if there is any take home, what would it be? I think the take home would be First Peter chapter one and verse three to eight. Okay. I think this is a summary of what we talk about this afternoon. Rise from the valley to glory, from darkness to everlasting glory. This is what Peter said. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his grace, mercy, he has given us a new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There is great hope. Christ suffered, but he was resurrected to a eternal life. Glory. Okay. Our hope, living hope, 
through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed <clears throat> in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So the trials that we experience, okay, is to prove the genuineness of our faith. If we believe that Christ with us is with us and he is beside us and he is comforting us, we can walk through them. And the result of which is praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is with you. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you have not seen him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We know that Christ has suffered for us and he has paved the way for us and he is there for us. We are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. What is the end result of our faith? The end of our end goal? The end goal? Friends and brethren, it is the salvation of your souls. Yes, in closing, my brethren and friends, Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. He has gone before us. He has paved the way. And he's here to comfort us. So let us walk as he walked. Walk from trial to triumph. Rise from the valley to glory. So with that, a glorious Sabbath day and the day of the feast, uh, the festival of the 11th day and the Passover. May the Lord be with all of us. God bless.